Goeiemorgen aan allemaal. Good morning to everyone. Jumela. Saubana. Hi. Is that the fifth language? Hi. You are so welcome. So welcome at Moraleda Park. And on behalf of our leadership and on behalf of the leadership of Jericho Walls, we welcome you to this prayer seminar, prayer concert, time with the Lord. And we, I, I just sense already a, a wonderful atmosphere, atmosphere of joy. We heard last night, we are working by faith and not by feeling or not by spirit. Ek hoor is vragies mense van hoopstad, jy het nou niks verstaan wat ek nou gesê het nie, want in uh, vrystaat praat hulle ons die ingels nie. Weet jy wat hulle het sê, hulle gaan hulle wat hoop vries het, hulle gaan vries het die by die soto, le Afrikaanse vel, hulle het die uh, uh, Engliesie. Toe ek het nie nou in die taal gepraat nie, niemand hoef uit te leen nie, ek het maar net in Tswana gepraat, so dat allemaal welkom voel. Mense van hoopstad, ach jy is so welkom, mense van die vrystaat. Is daar mense van, ja, is daar mense van Noordwest? Wow, wow, wonderful, wonderful. François, the revival started in 1996 day. And you are part of the revival. So you take the flame of the revival back to the Northwest area. And Piet, jylle van die, van die herleving terug na Vrijstaat toe. Will you please, will you please, just from this side, from your left hand side, just shift in to the middle. And you here from your right hand side, just shift in to the middle so that we can make space in the, at the corners, at the sides. Please. Terwijl jylle staan, is die mense, ek hoop nie is mense van WP en die macht, is die mense van die kap? Wow! <laughs> jylle is welkom. <laughs> Om Toby, jy is ook welkom hoor. Ok. And then obviously people from Twane. People from Twane, are you here? Yeah. Wonderful. And Twane surrounding areas, people from Mamelodi. Yeah. Wonderful, you are so welcome. And now people from Fasfontein. I know they are here. They are about 50 kilometers north. You are so welcome, people from Fasfontein. Heet ek iemand gemis? Opumalanga. Oh, jylle is ook hier Okay. And all the others, they don't count. Yeah? <laughs> where are the personnel? I know they are busy, but where are the personnel, board members, in gewone lidmate van Moraleta Park? Are you here? Oh, wonderful. Moraleta Park, will you just turn around? Just stand. Turn around and greet the other people, our visitors around you. Just greet them and say hi to them and bless them. Wonderful. This is a joyful noise. Owen, we praise the Lord for you guys. We welcome you. Okay. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus, body of Christ, church of God, South Africa needs revival. That's why we're here. There were many, many revivals without preaching. Many revivals without worship. Many revivals without testimonies. But no revival without prayer. Is it Edwin, uh, Edwin Owen Orr that said, when God wants to do new things amongst his people, he sets them praying. And that's why we're here for today. Just a couple of announcements. We received yesterday from Kum, and thank you for all your trouble, Kum, for this. A lot of books of Pastor Jim Simbala, Rise, uh, Spirit Rising. Please, our bookshop is just around the corner, Shekinah Bookshop. Please, in the break, body break, and also at lunchtime, please help yourself there. Fresh wind, fresh fire. Benny Mostert years ago, years ago, Benny, I think it was 12, 13 years ago, he gave me this book and he changed my life totally. And from there on, I was praying that Simula will come to South Africa. Fresh wind, 
Fresh Fire. Breakthrough Prayer. Please, get all these books. You were made for more. And many more books of Pastor Simbala are available in the bookshop. The Afrikaans-speaking people. Moraleta Park het, uh, sy arm is MPA, Moraleta Park Associatie. En Dirkie hulle bied uh, in juni, augustus, september, oktober en november, bied hulle kursusse aan vir leiders en leraars. Ek weet, is een klomp leraars vanmorgen. By die uitgang daar, gaan jy hierdie pamflet kry en maak seker dat jy jou dominee stier, hy moet kom en dan ook die kerkraadslede in die bepaalde datum direct daarna. Can we get on that, just that, um, that slide, please? Many people want this teachings, and uh, it will be on DVD available. It will be on CD. You just send an email to order, order at moraletta.co.za, and then in a couple of weeks' time, you'll see that red circle. In a couple of weeks' time, you get on our website, www.moraletta.org, and on the right-hand corner of your screen, you just click on Vimeo. Vimeo. And without, it's gratis now. It's for free, and you can see all these, um, all these teachings the whole day on Vimeo. Basilia Restaurant is just underneath here. Pancakes, carrion rice, um, water, coffee during break and during lunchtime. You're most welcome to help yourself and to support them there. Jim Simbala is from Brooklyn Tabernacle, New York, and is in Brooklyn, saturated. He's the founder of the church. He and his lovely wife, Carol, are the senior pastors of the church. He hopefully will tell us something about Carol, but her choir at the Brooklyn Tabernacle already had won six Grammy Awards. Can we give the Lord a hand for that? Thank you, Lord Jesus. He's a man of prayer, a man of revival, a man of evangelism, and it is our honor this week, and especially today, that we have Pastor Jim with us. Pastor Jim, after today, you don't have to apply to be a church member or a family member at Moraleda Park. You, you are it already. We love you so much. We love you so much. Let's welcome Pastor Jim Simbala. Come on. Come on, guys. Pastor Jim, we appreciate you. Let's bow before the Lord. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for your presence today. We just want to honor you. We just want to lift your name up. We adore you. We want to express our love unto you, God. And we're standing before the throne. Kneel down our faces to the ground and just have one sentence today in our heart. Lord, we need you. We need your touch. We need your blessing. We need yourself. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you was here before that we entered this building. We praise your name. In Jesus' name. By a donkey to all of you. Good morning, everyone. So we're here together this morning, and we're going to look in God's word, and then we're going to pray. Spend time with the Lord. 
So let me tell you a little bit about myself from a certain angle. Um, so you can know a little bit about my journey and the church that I pastor in New York City. When I was about 11 years old, I heard commotion one night and I heard my mother crying. And I went to a, a door outside of our tiny apartment we grew up in. My brother and my sister all shared the same room. And my mother was crying and being comforted by my grandmother, her mother-in-law. And it was the first time I heard that she was crying because she had discovered my father was drinking and getting out of control. That was like a thunderbolt to me in my life. So for the next, all the years I was growing up, my dad became an alcoholic, eventually lost his job. And my house was a terrible place to be in most of the time. And uh, because when he got drunk, he got crazy drunk and vulgar and violent. So it was a horrible thing. I couldn't bring friends over to the house because I never knew how my dad would be, especially when he lost his job and he was home all the time. My mother didn't leave him even though he struck her. And I had a lot of bad memories in my mind of trying to protect my mother. As I got older and stronger, I could do a better job. But I stayed out of the house as much as I could. And what I threw myself into was sports, especially basketball. And I became um, a pretty good basketball player and made all city in New York City, which is uh, there's a lot of people there playing basketball. Basketball isn't played here, or it's not, not at all? Okay. I wish I could tell you I played rugby, but I didn't play rugby. <laughs> so it was basketball. Um, and I ended up going uh, to college on a basketball scholarship and went to school for free, and that was my life. But then at the end of college... God began to make me very uncomfortable inside. And even though I was heading into the business world, there was something going on, a hunger for God, but not knowing what was in store. I ended up marrying my former pastor's daughter who um, grew up in, as a minister's home. And untrained musically, can't read or write music still to this day, but has perfect pitch and a wonderful ear for harmonies and an influence of many different things in her, black gospel music, white gospel music, uh, very eclectic. And it was uh, interesting that uh, we talked on the phone yesterday and she reminded me you know, Jim, I wish I was with you there in Africa because her father was a missionary evangelist and he made trips to Africa north of here um, to Kenya and other places and would come back and play African native gospel music, people worshiping God with certain feeling and chords and uh, the beautiful way that they sang, that had a deep impression on her when she was very little, she was uh, young. <clears throat> so we ended up getting married and I was in the business world and um, through a series of events, God called us into the ministry. That's a long story, I don't wanna bore you with it. But we ended up in a little rundown building in downtown Brooklyn. Now Brooklyn is one of the five boroughs of New York City. New York City's made up of five boroughs. And Brooklyn right now has grown and has always been huge. But right now, Brooklyn, just the borough that I, I live in, was born in, is the fourth, uh, fourth largest city in all of America, if it was a city. 
after New York, L.A., and Chicago, Los Angeles and Chicago. So we ended up in downtown Brooklyn where nobody would want to go. A lot of drugs. Uh, downtown Brooklyn had become really messed up. And the building that we came to, the pastor of this little church had left. Uh, uh, pastor Villa misspoke. I'm not the founder of the church. We came when there were 12, 15, 17 people on a good Sunday, um, and sometimes just two or three on a midweek service. And this was all new to me. You know, I've been studying and studying, continue to study and study. You know, all you pastors and leaders here, you have to live in your Bible. Amen? You got to live in it. You know why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So... As I told the church here on Sunday, at the beginning, it was so hard. My wife would get on the keyboard or play, and she knew exactly what to do in her gifting, but my sermons were so bad that I fell asleep while I was preaching and not just, and not just the congregation, but it is what it is. So um, I was faced with the problem that integrated, international area, no crack, no cocaine yet, but lots of heroin and lots of gangs, <clears throat> violent gangs, which has now become a resurgence, and we have gangs now in the New York area <clears throat> and outside of New York in um, Long Island that are just committing most of the murders that are going on. <clears throat> But back then, it was just a rundown block with prostitutes working not far away. And um, you wouldn't want to come there. No one would want to leave their church to come to that church. But that's where God put us. So we couldn't get into robbing members of other churches. You know, that's a, an industry in America. Is it like that in South Africa, maybe? I better not talk about that, I can tell. <clears throat> but the strategy being trying to get people to leave their church to come to your church. And no angels rejoice when that happens. Angels only rejoice when a, a sinner who doesn't know God turns to Christ. Amen? Amen. And it's really a sad way to uh, spend your life trying to rob other Christians so that you'll have numbers and think you're successful. If people transfer, praise God. But that's not our goal. Um, we, we had to make converts. And you know, a lot of pastors and a lot of churches go a whole lifetime and never see the blessing of converts. You know, converts. Like Jesus, you must said, you must be born again. The Christian church is only made up, supposed to be made up of Christians. We welcome all to come and hear the message, but... Membership, communion, baptism is only for those who have been born again. They're blurring those lines now in America. It'll happen here too, or is happening, where they're redefining what the church is. But you can't redefine the church because it's not your church, and it's not my church. You never died for anyone on a cross, so Jesus did, and he's the only one that can tell us what a church is. It's not a black church. It's not African church. It's not a white church, not American church. It's not Jewish. It's not Gentile. It's his church. And he defines and wants to run the church the way he wants to run it. So when people tell me they have a vision for their church, I get a little nervous because it's not your church. It's funny having a vision for someone else's church. It's his church, and he gave us his vision for the church. It's right here in the Bible. Everybody in favor say amen. amen. So he doesn't need any creative thought from me because I'm not that smart, and neither are you. He laid out exactly the message we should preach and the means of seeing his blessing. So it's strange in America where you, feel, you hear people have visions for their church, and it goes against the the Bible of the one who started the church. Jesus said, upon the, this rock, I will build my church, not your church or my church, his church. 
so that he can get all the glory. Amen? So when a pastor gets glory or a church name gets glory or a denomination gets glory, we're somewhere way, way, way far away from what the New Testament is teaching us. We're not interested in pastors' names or denominational names. To God, they don't exist. No denomination, whatever yours might be, exists to God because he only has one body, and he doesn't like when we divide it. He only has one church. Amen? Amen. And one of the signs of carnality is to say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos. None of those died for us. Christ died for us, and we all belong to Jesus, so I'm here with you. We are brothers and sisters together. I don't care what name your church is or what name my church is. We are the church. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body. There's only one body, and we have to root for each other and pray for each other. Otherwise, we're dividing up what Jesus made one. Father, that they might be one even as we are one. How many are happy there's only one church and we're all in it? Let's put our hands together and say amen to that. So now I was in my little church, the local church, the one I was there put in charge. It was a sad affair. It was so depressing that because the people we inherited, some of them were like totally out of their minds. I don't know what was going on there. Um... So we found out uh, that actually for the church to grow, I just put this in, we actually had to lose people. We did. Because the pastor before me was of the school of thought just to keep anyone in the building, let everyone do and say whatever they wanted. And that's no way to have a church. So I realized as I started to learn and God began to teach me that you had to get a core of people together to pray and to be on the same page and to be in unity, right? And, and the people we had, we had some precious people, but then there were others who were totally whacked out in their minds and with strange religious kind of spirits. So we began to pray, God, get a group together because how can we grow unless you get a core together that can pray and love people and present the gospel? So as that happened and the church grew just a little bit to um, 40 or 50 people, uh, and the first offering I took at that church was $85 was the total tithes and offerings. So my wife knew she had to get a job. I had to get a job, a second job, because we already had our girl, Chrissy, uh, first girl. And, um, you know, like Paul had a men tense at certain times. And um, it was was a struggle. It was hard. And um, Carol has 240 people now in the choir, Sometimes we'll have in three services on Sunday, 10,000, 8, 8, 9, 10,000 people. But she started with nine people, and we just had a handful of people coming to the church. But as it grew a little bit, I realized, wait a minute, I don't want to waste my life just going through the motions of having church. That's so boring, just having church and never seeing God work. And I got desperate, and one day, alone in the church auditorium, I was walking back and forth praying, alone, knowing that that night there would be five or ten people coming. I said, God, if you're not going to change me, if you're not going to use Carol and I, if we're not going to see a harvest so that your name would be glorified. I mean, there's enough sinners all around me. There's enough sinners in South Africa as a mission field, am I correct? But if you're not going to do that, then take my life. Then I don't want to live. I knew God could take care of my wife and my daughter. But the thought of just going through the motions, preaching, going through all of that, and never seeing the hand of the Lord. You know, in Acts, it says certain men from Cyprus and Cyrene, (laughs) that's in Africa, went to uh, um, uh, Antioch, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and multitudes turned to the Lord. That's what I wanted to see. I just want to see people turn to the Lord. 
so we could baptize them and disciple them. So they would go from old ways of living to new ways of living in Jesus Christ. No more drugs, no more alcohol, no more whatever they were into. Change, you know, sin washed away and people become new. Can, can't God still do that? That's, that was what was in my heart then. I don't want to talk about revivals in the past. I learned from them. I know a lot about those. Or I don't want to talk about hearing people say, one day God is going to do this great thing. Because I saw ministers talk like that for 20, 30 years, and nothing ever happened. They lived in the past and in some illusory future, but in their own lives, they never saw the hand of the Lord stretched out. And I just had this in me. No, I want to see God work in my life and in Carol's life and in the church. Can I see that? Don't I have a right to want that? Didn't God put that in the Bible? Did, did he put it in to tempt us, to torment us? To mock us? No, he put it in so we would aspire for that and say, God, do it again. I mean, if they did it in the early church where they had no Bibles to hand out, no buildings, no, no microphones, no choirs. Imagine 300 years, there were no church buildings in the, in the Christian church. There never was a public building for 300 years. And they turned the world upside down. How'd they do that? No money, no one for them, government, no government, whatever kind of thing. Jew, the synagogue was against them. The Roman government was against them. And they still, you couldn't stop them. Why can't God do that again? You see people in the street overdosing is still happening today. And nothing's really much changed in my life now. I still feel overwhelmed by everything <clears throat> happening around me in New York City and, and, and just... God, show us how to reach people. Help us to multiply ourselves. Members going out and, and witnessing for Christ. I mean, can't God still do that? Hello? So one day, I got real sick. I had no health insurance. Had no doctor. Had no money. And I got a terrible cough. Terrible cough. It was so violent that I couldn't sleep in the bed with my wife at night because I would just keep her up, coughing, coughing, coughing. And, you know, I was young and strong, but now I was weak. I was still playing basketball at times, but really got sick. So my father-in-law then was living in Florida, and he said, why don't you come down here and just rest and, and sit in the sun or something? So I said, yeah, I'll come down there to just rest. So while I got down there, and um, about the second day, I went on a boat to fish, not because I enjoy fishing. I do a little bit, but I just wanted to get away and be alone somewhere. So it was a big fishing boat, and there were only maybe 20, 25 people on it, but it could take over 100, 150 people and the kind of boats that just go out, you pay money, they go out an hour, and then they stop, and they have a radar that looks for fish, and you, you, you fish. And I went to the side of the boat where nobody was there, and I just wanted to be alone and fish. I didn't care whether I caught or not. I wanted to just feel that heat and stand in the sun and sit. And I began to talk to God. I got desperate. And I began to say to God, God, what do I do? What do I do? There's all these formulas for how you grow a church in America then as there is now. Church growth formulas. But I was in a different situation. You know, one, one said, you got to buy, uh, back then, you got to get buses. Buy buses and go out and pick up people all over where you are and bring them in. That's, you know, but, or small groups. You can't have a church without little small groups. But I had no money to buy a bus. And if they want to take a bus, take the public buses. They come right near the church. More than half of our people now don't have a car. It's totally different than here. Um, they come by public transportation. Subways and buses all come to downtown Brooklyn. And now we're in a, in a vast theater that is so well located. But I had no money back then to buy buses. And small groups, no one's going to go to the neighborhoods where our people live. The police don't want to go to those neighborhoods. 
How you can have small groups and tiny little apartments and, and, and the husband's against the wife if there's even a husband there. He's not a Christian. It just, it just it was a totally different world. So God, what do I do? You know, I'm just learning how to preach. I, I'm, I'm, I feel like overwhelmed. God, what do I do? You have to speak to me. And in the closest encounter that I've ever had with the Lord, probably, almost like an audible voice, but not, and I'll trust you to judge whether I'm, what I'm saying is true, I felt the Lord speak to me in this profound way, and I just wept for hours after that. I just sat in that boat and just wept, because when God draws near to you, at least for me, I just weep. I weep for brokenness, and I weep for joy, but I weep. And what I felt the Lord say to me was this. If you and Carol will lead the people to pray, if you will just lead the people to pray, I will give you every sermon that you need. Because I was insecure about that. I will give you the sermons you need. If you just, with the people, seek me, pray, spend time with me. Number two, All the money that you ever will need, I will supply, both for you and your wife, which was touch and go at that time, and for the church. I will supply that if you and your wife just lead the people to pray. And lastly, there will never be a building large enough to contain all the people that I'll bring in if you just lead the people to pray. Preach the gospel. Oh, that was profound to me. And I knew it wasn't some wild teaching, was it? Because the Bible, from beginning to end, reinforces the fact that God's house shall be called a house of what? Not preaching. Preaching is important. But the disciples never said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to preach. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. So I knew this was no crazy new doctrine because remember, when anybody comes up to you and says some weird thing, God told me this or God told me it could be the Lord, but you judge it by the word of God. God is never going to say anything that will contradict his word. Can I say it here aloud? Amen on that. So there's a lot of good things happening, but then there's people who mistake their imagination for the Holy Spirit and they say things contrary to the Bible. So you judge everything by the word of God. So I knew this wasn't something wild and new. No. And as our brother, Pastor Willem said, all revivals have begun by people just getting sick and tired of being sick and tired. And they begin to pray and say, God, do something new in my church. I can't take the same old, same old routine, little box that I'm living in. Maybe you're in one in your church or in your own life. I want, I want to taste and see what the, that the Lord is good. I don't want to just sing about it. I want to actually experience that. You know, there's an old saying, doctrine without experience with God is just like faith without works. It's dead. You can have the best doctrine, but if you don't have interaction with the living God and he's not stretching out his hand to do things, it's dead. It's dead. You can have, in your mind, in my mind, good theology, but without the experience of God and his spirit, it gets so dry and dead, does it not? And then there's no fruit. There's no fruit. Only God can produce fruit. So I came back charged by that and began to tell the people, look, our midweek service is going to be the, the barometer of the church and the engine. You know, Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said that the prayer meeting in his church was the um, engine that drove his church. And we began to see that number grow and grow. And now in midweek service for the prayer meeting, we see sometimes up to 2,000 people gather, more than 1,000 people coming and praying and calling on God and asking God to do new things. And it's strange now, and we must be careful of this as I read now from Scripture, that what was in the early church, sometimes now we are missing. Churches now 
are centered on the pastor's preaching or his personality or he's a super pastor or some supposedly super person. There, there are no super pastors. There's just a super Jesus. The only great person in the Christian church is Jesus. Men and women, they come and they go. Uh, the one who plants and the one who waters, they're, only, they're all nothing, the Bible says. Only God who gives the increase is worthy to be talked about and praised. Amen? But we live in the cult of the personality in the time of the cult of the personality and the pastor and the leader and all of that. And we can have, this is odd, you can have great teaching, a pastor with good teaching and an eloquent speech and yet produce a prayerless church. That's all over America. Again, I can't speak to South Africa. I don't know. But you can have great music, but no prayer. You can have great praise and worship, no prayer. You can have great teaching, supposedly, and all of that. But something must be disconnected or wrong if it doesn't lead people wanting to be with God for free. You can have a concert and charge all kinds of money. People will come. They'll flock to hear a preacher. But if you just say, come on, let's be in God's presence and talk to him and receive what only he can do, you find very little interest. That must not be a good sign. Because the Bible says in Acts 2 that the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles. Here's the first description of the church. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's in the word of God. And in fellowship, that means sharing of one another's lives, loving, helping each other. And in the breaking of bread, that probably meant not only communion, taking communion, but also meals at each other's homes or wherever. And in prayer, that's how the church began. They continued in prayer. And they remembered what the Lord had said. Men ought always to pray and not give up. Listen to his teaching. Ask and you shall what? Receive. Seek and you'll what? And if you knock, it what? It will be open to you. And he gave parables about a widow who would just be so persistent uh, to a judge and people just getting a hold of God and himself disappearing. Just think of this. Jesus, the Son of God, would disappear and spend whole nights in prayer. And he was the Son of God with no sin like you and me. I mean, is that hard to believe? Jesus had to pray. He had to be in communion with the Father. So, the early church began, and they would have great successes and blessings as they continued in prayer, but then problems came. And their reaction to this one problem, I think, will be helpful to us. The Bible tells us that in Acts 12 that Herod had James, the brother of John, arrested and beheaded. He was killed and he was a leader in the church. When he saw that this made the people happy, he had Peter arrested and threw him in jail and was planning to do away with Peter. And it says, after arresting him, verse 6, verse 4, he put him in prison, look at me please, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Sixteen people on a rotation. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Get this picture. No money, no political influence. No public buildings, no connections, no influence. Their leader is taken from them. He's in prison, and it looks like it's all over. The church shuts down everything, and one translation has, and a steady stream of prayer goes up to God for Peter. In other words, they had nothing left to go to but God. See, that desperation is so helpful. When God permits us to be in a tight spot, it's usually to drive us to him. Because when we have things going for us or money or influence and all of that, it's so easy for all of us not to need him, not to go to God, but to just say, I got this thing together. I can do this. I can handle this. But now they knew Peter's gone unless God intervened. So they shut down everything and they just began to pray. 
That sounds foreign to our ears, doesn't it? We would, we would organize a resistance. We would petition in front of the government. You can't do that. That's not fair. He didn't commit any crimes. They couldn't do any of that. All they had was one thing. Oh, God, have mercy and help us. And when you and I have nothing but God, then we have everything going for us. Because with God, everything is possible. I'm so glad for every hardship I faced. I'm so glad for all the difficult places I have found myself in and still find myself in, needing $6 million once just recently, a few years ago, a number of years ago, and seeing God in 10 minutes provide $6 million from two different sources that I didn't even know. Because those situations drive you to God and you say, God, unless you move, I don't have a chance. And many times the blessings of God that we have, especially in your society where there's great affluence. And in America, churches can exist without God, without prayer, because they feel like I have the resources to do this. But we lose something precious when we stop reaching out to God. So that's what they did. They shut down everything and they prayed. You know, one time when I was facing dozens of millions of dollars project, I, I told the church on a Sunday, you know what? We're not going to have any services. Uh, we're going to have one service on Sunday. We were having then, I think, three or four in a previous theater that we were in. So we started the first service at 9, and the meeting ended at, let's say, 11. But I told the people, you can leave. The other people come in, but we're just going to keep praying the whole day. So there was one continuous. I never left the auditorium except to use the restroom, and we just stayed in there and prayed and waited on God. Isn't it wonderful that we can go to the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need? So... That's what they did, how whatever their form was. They prayed, a steady stream. Now, notice the response. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side, and he woke him up. Quick! Get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what was the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards, and then they came to the iron gate leading to the city itself, and it opened for them by itself, and they went through. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. So we have Peter here in prison, and we have the people praying, people praying, people praying, people waiting, people in God's presence, people petitioning God, oh, God, help Peter, and the power of that. Did you know that prayers are so precious that they're kept in bowls in heaven. Did you know that when you and I pray like we're going to do, these prayers never die. Prayer never dies. When we pray, it's so precious to God that he keeps them in bowls. Read the book of Revelation. They're, they're in bowls. So they're praying, and what happens? An angel, I want you to go beyond the specifics of this story, and I want you to see what God has promised for all of us in your church and in my church. An angel of the Lord appeared. Something from heaven was sent in answer to the people's prayers. The greatest thing that prayer brings in all of our lives personally and in our churches and for people, wayward sons and daughters that you might have, God sends something from heaven, an angel of the Lord, a dream. Like my daughter, uh, a dream that shook her when she was so far from God, my oldest girl, away from God. And my wife and I went through a two and a half year long nightmare. And something comes from heaven. 
the greatest need in the Brooklyn Tabernacle and Pastor Willem's church and in your church, wherever you're from, is we need something from heaven. We need something so divine and so from God that the people will know, "Uh uh-oh, this is not the pastor. This is not human. This is God. God is convicting of sin. Come on, let's put our hands together and say amen to that. Come on, let's all put our hands together and say amen. In other words, God, God is doing something. This is not Jim Cimbala. This is not any choir. This is not cleverness. This is not some software on a computer. This is almighty God. He's alive and he's doing something. Sometimes it can be invisible but palpable. Invisible but palpable. You can discern his presence and that he's drawing near his manifest presence, in answer to prayer, he comes. He sends some help. He sends something. And that changes everything in our lives. Look, look, if you get dry and discouraged and all of that, if you and I will just go to the throne of grace and spend time with God, he will send refreshing from heaven. He will send new strength. He'll send endurance. How many times have I been broken down? And if I can only find myself to the the throne of grace and go to God in prayer, he has refreshed me and encouraged me when I just wanted, I didn't know what to do. Didn't know what to do. Didn't know what to do. You know, one day, are these chairs connected? No, they're not. One day, uh, some years ago, Tremendous financial strain. Oh, my goodness. Every day it seemed like we needed $500,000 doing this project. It never costs what they say. It never finishes when they say. Um, And then traveling and writing books and overseeing other churches. We've started a bunch of churches. It just, as they say in Spanish, demasiado. It became too much. So I, I, my wife was away taking care of her mother down in Florida she, who was sick. And I just said, God, I need, I need something from you. I, I get a call. I was going to stay home that day and just be with the Lord. And I get a call from the church. And the, and the liaison with the architect and the contractor said, Pastor Simba, uh, they just told us we need... $600,000 by next Tuesday or they're going to walk off the job. I know, but didn't we have money for that? I know, but we went through that when we need, we need to. Uh, and, and our congregation is poor. Lower income people for the most part. Middle income. So I go, I'm getting dressed. I'm going to have to go into the church. I'm get, I said, I'll be in in an hour. I lived out then in Queens in another borough. So I'm getting my clothes to go to church. And I feel the Lord speak to me and say, where are you going? Where am I going? I'm going to church. How about that? I'm going to church. I'm the pastor. And usually that's a good place to go when you're the pastor. And if you need $600,000, you maybe go to church. I don't know. Call someone. Do something. But I I was depleted. So... No, just be with me. No, listen, be with me. You need me more than the 600,000. I can take care of that, but you need me. So I went up to this attic that I had there. I called the church and I said, I'm not coming in. Don't expect me. I'm not coming. So I went in that attic and I sat down in a chair about 10 something in the morning I got a large print NIV Bible. Didn't even have the faith to pray. And I said, God, I'm not leaving here until I I meet you. You know, prayer is a lot more than asking God for things. It's just being with him. I sat there. I read the scriptures. Faith began to grow in my heart. I got out of there at maybe 20 to 6 at night. I was a different person. Late in the afternoon, 
I felt God visit me in that room. The room seemed to be filled with his presence. And he baptized me with something that I said as he's my witness listening to me today, right now. I said out loud, what is this? And the best I could feel was he was baptizing me with the peace of God. You know, brothers and sisters, we think we know what the peace of God is. We're just skimming the surface. It has depths that nobody can understand. It's the peace of God which passes what? All understanding. I was so lifted above all of my troubles. I had renewed strength. He spoke to me way back then. That was eight years ago about, strangely, not uh, preaching with notes anymore. For eight and a half years now, I've not preached with notes. Nothing wrong with preaching with notes, but it was something he dealt with me for certain reasons, to preach without notes. And, uh, and guess what? At about 20 to 6, I left there a new person, because when you pray and you spend time with God, not just talking and asking and petitioning, but listening, waiting for God to speak to us. While I was there late in the afternoon, I got a, a phone call, and they said, guess what? This person called, and that thing happened, and guess what, Pastor? You don't need to come in anyway, because God gave the $600,000 we needed. You know what? He works. Listen, listen. He works for those who wait for him. He works for those who wait for him. It's found in the book of Isaiah. He works for those who wait for him. So something from heaven came to help me. Something from heaven will come to your church. Look at me. We pray. We, we ask God. Something from heaven must come or else the word of God is not true. And the word of God is true. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Something will come. We've got to persevere. We've got to wait. But God will send strength. He'll send help. He'll send uh, an angel of the Lord. He'll send something. He'll de deliver that son or daughter you're worried about. He'll wake them up in the middle of the night. He'll do something. I don't know how he does it. Don't put him in a box. Just know this. God's going to answer. How many believe that with all your heart? Just lift your hand. God will send something from heaven. Number two, the angel slapped Peter and said, wake up. When people pray, God comes and wakes people up. He wakes people up. Isn't that what you need in a lot of our churches? They're, they're there, they're sitting there, but they are sleeping. Not physically sleeping, they're spiritually sleeping. What revival is and when God comes, when God's people pray, is suddenly there's an awakening. One of the great revivals in our country uh, during the time before we became a nation in America is called the Great Awakening. Why? Because God came and suddenly people who were lukewarm said, I can't live like this anymore. I got to draw near to God. Sinners got convicted of their sin. Is there nothing worse? This is my ultimate dread. Is there nothing worse than to have people come to church who are not living for God, sleeping around, doing drugs, full of racial prejudice, and they just sit there week after week, and they never change? And you're preaching, and we're singing praise and worship, and there's no change in their lifestyle? That's the ultimate nightmare. That's a nightmare. A nightmare. But when people pray, God comes and wakes people up. He wakes people. I don't even know how he does it, but he wakes people up. Sinners get awakened. Members get awakened and want to reproduce themselves and share Christ. When God's people pray, God sends something to wake people up. And in this case, it was a literal waking up. Peter was sleeping, guarded, totally chained, everything. So we've learned two things. When God's people pray... God sends something from heaven. I need that. I'm flying back tomorrow to New York. Services on Sunday. Oh, God, if I'm going to preach, would you please wake somebody up through my preaching or through the service or whatever? Would you please, God, just wake people up? Send something to wake them up. I can't wake them up. I'm just a guy. I can just talk. And even though my doctrine is right, if I'm, if I'm preaching correctly, that, that word alone, you need the word with the Spirit. You need that awakening. 
Otherwise, the people get harder, even though you're preaching the word. You're not saying amen, but it's true. So, he wakes people up, and number two, uh, he, he sends something from heaven, and he wakes people up. Lastly, or next to last, suddenly the chains fell off Peter's hands. When we pray and God comes, chains are broken. Do you hear me? Chains are broken. In our own lives, besetting sins, that power is broken by God's spirit in answer to prayer. Chains are broken. Oxycontin and all these prescription drugs, which is the newest epidemic in our country, totally out of control, makes heroin and cocaine look like child's play. Now people are overdosing on these opioids. You know what they're mixing now? I, I, I forgot to tell you, Pastor Willem. This opioid thing, which is a downer, but they call, you're going to get a high, but it's a down like heroin. It's now not... Poor people in the inner city injecting themselves. That was when we began. You know, you find a drug addict overdosed on a roof or in some alley. No, 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 no. Now it's middle class. It's all races. And people are just so empty and sick and tired of being empty that they're turning to something to dull them, especially people, veterans who have fought in the Middle East are coming back. They're twice as likely to get hooked. And now the fatalities are multiplying all around the country. And it's, it's prescription drugs. It's not, you know, injecting yourself. It's, it's first you start with maybe smoking weed. Now you're taking these opioids, Oxycontin, and these other things. So now that's not enough because Satan is always driving people to worse, right? The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. So now they're mixing with the, that and mixing with this new um, synthetic heroin that, that they graduate to because you get used to one high, now you got to have a new high. You got to get a, a, a bigger buzz. They are now mixing in America, right? It, among middle class people, they are mixing a, I don't know the name of the chemical, it tranquilizes elephants. You shoot it, a dart into an elephant. Imagine what the power must be to put an elephant down and to sleep. They're mixing that now into these opioids. They have one chemical that if it gets accidentally mixed in, listen, they're taking heroin, a synthetic heroin with a fentanyl is what it's called. And the thing is so strong, one, one kind of fentanyl. It is like um, a, 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 a 500 times stronger than opium. And when they inject it, it's such instant death that the police are finding people with the needle still in the arm. Didn't even get to pull it out. And we have the gospel. And we, have, we can see the power of God wake these people up and say, you don't need that high. You don't need those drugs. You can have Jesus. Oh, brothers and sisters, listen, you can't have revival just to have revival. Charles Finney said a lot of churches miss out on revival because they want to see God come just so they can brag. Our church has revival. We're so corrupt in our selfishness that that can get in there. Why we need God to come is to save the people who are out there lost all over South Africa, all over America. They don't know Jesus. They're going to die and face heaven or hell. We can't sit there and have church, can we? Are you with me on this or what? How could I sit there and say, well, praise God, look what he's done. People visit from around the world to come and they read a book I wrote or, or, and all of this. No, how about, there's more to do. There's more to reach. We don't want revival for revival's sake. We want revival so that we can spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I just say something about that? You know what God has to shake some people from? Is their miserable lack of concern for people who are other, other colors, other classes of people. How in the world are we going to have revival if we don't want to reach all the people that Christ died for? Try, I mean, try to, try to figure that out. God, we want you. 
But we don't want you so that we can reach everybody. We want you so we can just reach people like us, so we can keep up our culture. That's sick. That's a very sick thing. That's in America all over. Target groups. We want white people. We don't want black. We want middle class. We don't want poor. We want uh, 20-something. We don't want 40, 50, 60. That's an ugly, terrible thing. God will never bless that. We got to get down to the bottom of ourselves and say, God, you, you love the world that you gave your son to die for all people, and I don't want to reach all people. No, that's impossible. I have to reach all people. God has to come and awaken people. He has to awaken me. I got to get to be a better preacher. I don't know if you're being helped, but I'm preaching to myself today. I need that. I need an awakening. I need the chains broken. When God comes, chains are broken. You know that? You don't have self-control, suddenly that, that chain is broken and you'll be able to spend more time in the word. That, that selfishness, that, that inordinate affection for, for money or sports or whatever, those chains are only broken by the Holy Spirit. You could teach until you're blue in the face. No, nobody's changing unless God comes. Do I get an amen? amen. Nothing's going to happen. And finally, for us that are facing some problems, Peter he obviously wasn't praying. He was sleeping. And the angel leads him out, and they pass two doorways to get out of the prison, and now they come to the ultimate shut, locked, iron door that leads to freedom. And the Bible just adds very beautifully, and the door opened by itself. When God comes, when people pray and God comes, doors open. Doors open. Doors open for, listen, for ministry. Doors open for evangelism. Doors open for finances. By themselves. They didn't get there and the angel said, come on, Peter, get a battering ram. I'll get a battering ram. Ready? One, two, three. Let's run. Knock this thing open. No, it opened by itself. Remember what Paul said? Pray for me. For a wide and effectual door of service has opened for me, but there are many adversaries. Open doors are something we need in our churches. Doors for ministry, doors among neighborhoods. I, I don't even know the different doors God has to open, but when God's people pray, God sends his spirit something from heaven. People are awakened. Chains are broken. Chains are broken and doors open when God comes. I've seen God do more in 10 minutes when his presence comes than in 10 of my sermons. That's the truth. Lives are changed. Revelation comes just... Just awesome. So I'm going to go out on the limb here and share something with you as I close and we pray. We have to change our services, brothers and sisters, and make room for the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have to. These rehearsed little Mickey Mouse meetings. You know who Mickey Mouse is here? I, I, no, that's not a phrase you use here. No. You don't know Mickey Mouse. Understand. You understand. Okay. For, forgive my Americanism. <laughs> These little manufactured meetings so far into the Bible. Rehearsed everything down to the minute. Why? You got to get the people out. They don't want to be there for long. Got to get them out. I don't know what they're going to do in heaven. There's no end. <laughs> no cell phones. No, I'm serious. Have you ever thought about that? Why would God punish people and send them to heaven when they don't want to be with them on earth? No, I, I'm just not legalistic. I'm just asking that question. If you don't want to be with God and you don't enjoy his presence here, why would he punish you and say, all you're going to have now is God for all eternity? So 
Anybody here agree, disagree with what I'm about to say doctrinally? You're not in tune with this. May God speak to you. I'll just tell you what happened. We were having services. Maybe my friend Andrew here, who I just re-met, was in the church at that time. I can't remember. We have someone living in South Africa now who used to be at the Brooklyn Tabernacle and a great singer, too. Um, so we're having three services a day, if I can remember. And I don't eat anymore now during our three services um, because I can get like a lull or get a little tired. And uh, it was the afternoon service. God, help me to tell this so that you're glorified and the people will know that you're real. So I'm sitting at that time up on the platform and Carol's directing the choir, and we had the pulpit chairs. Now we have them over on the side, but we have the ministers at that time were sitting up there like the Sanhedrin or whatever. <laughs> and uh, now we sit on the side. So I was sitting this way, and um, no. For this particular instance, I was, um, I was sitting in the front because I wanted to see the choir. And they were singing, and I didn't like them behind me like that. So I went down and sat like where Pastor Willem is in the front row. And my wife had said to me, I'm going to sing uh, two songs today. She does what she does. And she tries to be led by the Spirit. So she's there. And uh, she's leading the song, and a, and a guy comes out to sing a solo who's actually visiting from one of our daughter churches, a former crack addict, who got, it was a construction worker, but got hooked on crack and would blow all the money from his paycheck before he could even get home and would sometimes disappear for three or four days into a crack house. And at one time was selling crack and, and collecting money and lived in a dog house with a dog. Big dog. So he was singing a song, and I went to sit there in the front row, and we had been praying, God, come from heaven and, and do what only you can do. So I'm sitting there. The song is half over, and suddenly the spirit comes on me. I feel. And the spirit begins to tell me, go up, go up. Preach the gospel now, quickly. Go up, tell the people that I love them. Go up now and tell them, I sent my son. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them now. Go up and tell them. That was very strange. I mean, doesn't God know you do that at the end of the service and not at the beginning? And I don't like to do weird things just to do weird things. You know, sometimes people in the, uh, who are trying to be spirit-led, they think that to be led by the spirit, you act very weird. But some people who act weird, they're just weird. How many say amen to that? <laughs> they're just weird. Remember that gentleman we talked to. So they're just weird. It's not the spirit. But I don't like to do things purportedly of the spirit when it's not. I don't want to ever do that. So I'm sitting there, and I feel this get up. Well, the song's now two-thirds over. Go now. I say, God, I, I can't do that. You know, we haven't taken the offering yet. You know, we have a, a pattern here, God. I mean, you, you don't preach the gospel 25 minutes into the service. Just don't do that. But see, that's how so limited we are, right? so full of ourselves that we know what we're doing. So now the thought of not doing it is like a sword. And God is saying to me, you prayed and you said, lead me. I'm leading you, now do it. I go, oh, wow. So now the song is coming to an end, and I start walking. And I come up around, and my wife is ending the song, and she turns and looks at me as if to say, I... 
I thought I told you we're going to do two songs. You're coming up after just one song. But she could tell something was up. As God is my holy witness, I grabbed the soloist before he could leave. I took the microphone, and I said, listen, Calvin, tell everybody in two minutes what Jesus did for you. Tell them. Tell them how you were bound on crack. Tell them everything. Two minutes you got. He took the microphone like he was waiting for it. He gave the testimony, shared the God, you know, what Jesus had done. I grabbed the microphone from him. I say, listen, right now, God loves you. If you need Jesus, he's the only one who can set you free. He is the only one who can forgive your sins. He's the only one who can give you a new beginning, a new start in life. That's what you need. You need a new beginning. You need a new start. He's the only one who can take and wash away the past. And, you know, the gospel, you don't need 30 minutes for the gospel. You can present the gospel in a very short period of time, the good news of Jesus. Just read some of the sermons in the book of Acts. Uh, they had great results, and they're, you know, they're not four hours long. So I, I preached. I said, right now, you come forward. Right now, all right? Right now, the choir's still standing. You come down from wherever you are, and I see people just, I mean, the meeting's not even a half hour old. People are flooding because God is there. He's awakening. He's breaking chains. He, he sent his presence. He sent his spirit. So we're, we're, I'm, I'm watching this, and there's some young kid, white kid, about 19, just weeping, and I see other people, all different races. And um, I go, okay, listen, here, you pray after me. I'm going to pray out loud, but I, I pray from your heart. Let's pray out loud this prayer. Dear God, dear God, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me. I, I, I put my trust in you. I believe that Jesus was crucified for me and rose from the dead, etc. I pray. I go, okay, it's all over. Here we pray. So after a little season, I say, go back. All right, go back to your seats. All right, let me figure out what we should do now. Okay. So listen, now the choir is going to sing another song, and we'll take the offering, and then I preach a little shorter at the end uh, because we had another service after that, and the meeting went on. Then I do another one after that. So on Tuesday, I'm back in the office, and my daughter Sue was working in one of the departments in the church. She doesn't work there anymore. She's the head of drama now and, and women's ministry. But she was working, receiving phone calls. And she said, uh, walked in my office, and she said, Daddy, God is awesome. I said, yeah, I know. She said, no, you don't know what happened. I said, no, what happened? She said, I just got a call from a man from Texas. I said, yeah, what happened? Oh, he said, it started out like this, Daddy. He said, hey, listen, there's a song you sing in your church. I want the music for, the church, for that song. I want the music for this song. You sing it in your church. What's the name of the song? He gave it. She went, I'm sorry, sir. We don't have music for that song. We just sing it, but we don't have music for it. No, no, I know that you have music from your music, from the choir and all. She said, no, they only make books. This company makes books of all the songs that, that we record. When the choir records a song, they make choral books, and it's sung around the country, sometimes around the world. But we never recorded that song, so there's no book. He said, no, listen, I got to have the music for that song. I know you sing it there. I was just there on Sunday, and I know you sing that song. I, how am I going to get that music? So Sue, my daughter, said, well, listen, I, I'll tell you what. I, I can't help you with it. I could do some research, but I'll tell my mother that you like that song. And he went, your mother? Who's your mother? No, my mother is Carol Cimbala. My, I'm Susan Cimbala Petri. He said, you're, you're the pastor's daughter? Yeah. I want you to tell him something. I'm a businessman from Dallas, okay? We dedicated our boy to the Lord when he was born. Something went sideways in his life. He's gotten cold. He's gotten hard. He's running around with the wrong people. He's away from God. My wife and I don't know what to do. We're praying. We're praying. Nothing's working. We're talking. Nothing's happening. So I get an idea in my head. I had to go to New York on business. 
I got to go to New York on business. So I said to my wife, let's make a plan. So I say to my son, son, come with us to the New York City. Uh, I got business to do Thursday and Friday or whatever it was, and then we'll go to a Broadway uh, show or something, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, you know, enjoy New York City, go to a good restaurant. But the plan was, I was going to take him to, to your church, tell your dad. That was my plan, to take him to the church, because we're so concerned about it. So we wake up Sunday morning. We're going to check out of the hotel. We're heading in a taxi to the church for your second service. And I look at my documents from my secretary, and I go, oh, no. Oh, no. She put us on an earlier flight than I wanted. This is too early. We have to leave New York too early. I can't stay for the whole meeting. What am I going to do? I came here just for my son. So we get to your church, tell your daddy, we, we get to your church, and we're sitting up in the balcony, and I'm looking at my, my watch. We can only stay here about 40, 45 minutes. Well, at least we'll just hear the choir sing or something. And, and, and the choir gets up to sing, and I'm looking at the clock, and I'm feeling discouraged because we have to leave early. And the choir is singing a song, and suddenly your dad jumps out of his seat, runs up on the, on the platform like he shot out of a cannon, and he comes and he grabs the microphone and he tells the soloist, give your testimony quick. And, and, and he gets up and he says, all right, now, you come to Jesus right now. God loves you. He's made this moment right now. And stand up if you want, if you want, if you need Jesus. And he says, my son jumps up. He's the first person to stand. And then my, your, your dad says, come forward. And my son comes down. And he's crying like a baby. And my wife and I are up in the balcony. And we're crying like babies. And we see him put his hands up. And he's crying. And your dad looked over and noticed him. And then he leads them in prayer. And then he sends them back to their seats. And I'm looking. The minute he hit the seat, we grabbed him. We ran out. We got a taxi. We went to LaGuardia, to the airport. We flew back, wait, to Dallas. We're watching him in the seat. And it's the son that we raised. He's different. His face is different. His spirit is different. He's met God. So t tell your dad, I don't know what in the world was going on with him, why he ran up there. But, but it was just for my son. Listen, God altered a meeting just for one boy. How many believe that God would do something like that? Say amen to that. But, but, but I thought to myself, think of the times I've missed that. In a rote, in a, this is the way we do church. But when the spirit comes, chains are broken. People are awakened. Maybe you have somebody that you need awakened, a son or a daughter. I'm, I'm aware of that or conscious of that as I'm speaking now. Like that par those parents with that boy or my, my wife and I years ago with my daughter. Or maybe for your church. Let's all close our eyes. For your church. For your own ministry. You want to come to the throne of grace. What happens at the throne of grace? Two things. God gives mercy because we need it, because we sin and we make mistakes. And he gives grace. That means he imparts those things that we can't do for ourselves. If you're here today and you just need something from God, maybe you're burnt out like I was that day. You're keeping on, keeping on, but your batteries are way, way, way down, so dangerously low. He wants to strengthen you at the throne of grace. He wants to send something from heaven to deliver somebody, to change your church so that people leave and they say, don't remember the pastor's name, don't remember the church's name, but God is in the midst of those people. Whoa, what was that? That was God.